one day when we were talking, one of our children was a bit exasperated with the whole process and uh, made the closing remark in our discussion of, well, is there a McDonald's there? Because if there's not a McDonald's, I'm not going. So you see this vast, vast land that has just been ravaged with war and underdevelopment and its roads are terrible. So most of the work has to be done by airplane and along the way you find tragic suffering and loss and the people live in that constantly. There are many murders and killings even recently. Uh, I believe it was six women were out hoeing in their gardens and people from a neighboring village came and brutally murdered them. When we started the journey with Christian Veterinary Mission, and we started in Nakuru, Kenya, there was many Christians, uh, Kenyan Christians that were serving well and could easily take our roles. And so God showed us a vision for South Sudan um, through a, a short-term veterinary trip that I was part of. We went back on another a survey trip to the Taposa area. And so we moved from Nakuru and moved to Tarit in 2017 and have been working there with the AIM team in South Sudan um, since then. I was serving at a church in Minnesota and Gina was working at a vet clinic part-time. And in 2016, our church had a missions conference and Dr. Fred Van Gorkum and his wife Vicki came uh, to speak at the missions conference. They shared about a team that was forming in Tarit, South Sudan. And the focus of this team would be on relational disciple making. We really needed to take our children uh, on a vision trip so that they could see what life would be like for those of us in South Sudan and, and what life might be like for those who would be going to boarding school. So we went on that trip in 2017. We took 40 days uh, to pray together as a family and we came back together at the end of that time and we decided as a family that the Lord was calling us to go to Tarit, South Sudan. And so then in uh, the summer of 2018, the six of us loaded up some totes and we headed to Nairobi. And we dropped Hazel off at her boarding school, uh, which is near Nairobi. And then the rest of us drove into South Sudan, a three day journey by vehicle uh, as we traveled into our new home in Tarit. So because of the fight that has been taking place between Keala and their neighboring village called Havorere, uh, one of the uh, people from Havorere came very near to our village and they found my father was rearing uh, the, the goats and they began to, sort him, to, to shoot him and he died. And so we went with Gilda that day and uh, were able to be a part of that funeral for his father. And I got to share the good news of Jesus there at the funeral that day. But as we've been talking with Gildo and our other, uh, there are four pastors uh, who are the key leaders in the Kingdom Builders School. What we're hoping to see God do is to establish Kingdom Builders in places like this village of Kiala, where Gildo's father had been living, where he was murdered and there are currently no churches in this very important village of the Latuko people group uh, which surrounds Tarit. Uh, but I still have that vision that one day I myself will go and be also a kingdom builder in my very place so that my people will come to know who Christ is and to follow him just as I have, I'm following him right now. And one of the things we're doing in Tarit as a part of our school is to establish a demonstration farm. And uh, we are just now in the process of procuring the land for that farm to help come up with some agricultural uh, initiatives the students can take with them, both animal agriculture and plant agriculture, as they go to the villages to help provide for their own needs to support themselves as bivocational kingdom builder missionaries out in the villages. The thing that Gina and I have pursued all along is relational disciple making, to walk with people and to bring the word of God into those relationships and help them to be transformed and as we are being transformed along with them. One of the young men who's been so key in all of this is uh, a young guy by the name of Juma. As a young boy in the village, 
the one thing he could do to be productive was to go out and to dig or to cultivate. But the only payment that was given for that digging and for that cultivating was to be given a, a little plastic bag of, of pure grain alcohol. Juma knew that that's not something he wanted to do. That wasn't the life that uh, he wanted. And so in time, he became a follower of Jesus. And today, Juma goes back to his home village, which is about a 40 minute uh, motorcycle ride from where we live in Tarid. And he, every Sunday, he is leading a worship service there in that village. If God help, if I complete that one, I will be able to go to the village mm -hmm. and teach there as well as so, uh, making some discipleship for people there in the village. What you don't get from an international news perspective is the individual lives that live and thrive in a situation like South Sudan where you think nothing could thrive in their daily work of grinding sorghum from their family or going to the garden, looking after their cows. There is just genuine life that is happening inside of believers all over South Sudan. One of the things that we can see very clearly is a move within the church to really want to reach out to their own people. I think when we first got there, the idea was nice, but it, it was a missionary idea, a Western idea brought into the South Sudanese church. And local believers have caught the vision for what God is doing and we see how beneficial it is for a local person to reach their own people. One in particular person on our team, her name was Tessa, she just loved her friends within her church and within that friendship and that love she was encouraging them to do missions. Three of our members out of the four are going to come back to South Sudan and move out in the villages and because they will be in an unreached village, they can even go back to their churches in Tariq and help them engage in their unreached village. So it's our privilege just to come alongside of these guys and, and walk with them and disciple them and where they're at, apply the Bible to their daily challenges and keep walking and encouraging them when the suffering of South Sudan hits them. In using veterinary medicine to reach out to unreached people groups, it's been a very interesting application some of the ways that we have targeted is working as kind of a consulting veterinary or livestock person and going in to help our teammates, gathering 10 or 12 guys together and discussing application of medicines and diseases that they're facing with either their goats or their cows or sometimes the chickens that are in the villages. And then those teams can go engage um, the peoples around them. Troy and I um, work together with a young team of about six men who have been uh, involved in our churches and they have a heart to reach out into their community and to help as well as having an interest in poultry and we have been working with them to go out and do vaccinations regularly in the communities that we're in so that people don't lose their chickens every single year. We go out and do the Newcastle vaccine They've gotten to know some of the people that we repeat visit. And at each household that we come to, um, at the end after vaccines, uh, we will stop and have a little time of prayer, ask the people, how can we pray for your family? Within the Tarit setting, there's a large group of church members that are studying health sciences. So I would teach the communicable disease classes. Um, so in the classroom, I could present the gospel, but it's, my primary goal was not um, there as an evangelist, but as someone that was equipping those local believers um, within the school because they, in turn, when they graduate and go into the rural clinics, will be on the front lines of the unreached people groups. I think a big thing that I appreciate um, is just the power of prayer. We've gone to a place where suffering is proportionally larger than any place that we've ever experienced before. And so that term, transformational suffering, kind of sums up our experience in South Sudan. It brings a picture of how God uses suffering in our lives to bring about transformation, not only personally, but in communities around. So as we left uh, Hazel there at boarding school alone, she definitely uh, had the toughest transition in the beginning. And the Lord uh, really provided through wonderful dorm auntie that really took care of Hazel during her time and prayed with her and walked with her and many caring people uh, at RVA. Hazel and I were going out for a walk one day 
And she said, Dad, I miss Africa. I miss uh, just kind of living on the edge that uh, is being a part of living in Africa. And she said, I enjoyed it so much. So we're grateful that she allowed God to transform her heart and helping her to shape her into the young woman that she is today. And in each of those steps, uh, we saw how the Lord really walked with us in everything and grew our faith as a family.